In this video, we're going to be discussing two special tests used in the diagnosis of a high ankle sprain. But before we get into those, let's review some of the basic anatomy first. High ankle sprains refer to ligamentous damage around the ankle, but above the level of the talus. So if we look at this anatomy over here, medial view of the ankle and foot, right here we see the tibia, and then behind it, can't really see it too well, is the fibula. There are several ligaments that actually connect the tibia and the fibula. We'll talk about those in just a minute. But recall that distally, the tibia and the fibula form a concavity called the ankle mortis, which we can't see in this view. We'll see it in just a minute on the next slide. And that ankle mortis articulates with the bone beneath it, which is this one right here, called the talus. And this joint between the talus and the ankle mortis of the tibia and fibula is called the talocoral joint. Now the talus articulates with the calcaneus below it at a joint labeled here as the subtalar joint. And like I said a minute ago, these high ankle sprains cause ligamentous damage above the level of the talus, specifically damaging one of these three structures that we're going to go into right now. And we can actually see the first two pretty well in this bottom picture, a lateral view of the ankle. Those are the anterior and posterior tibiofibular ligaments. Sometimes I'll throw the inferior in there as well, but it's posterior and anterior tibiofibular ligaments. Make sure you differentiate these from the talofibular ligaments. These are ligaments uh, that connect the talus and the fibula, whereas these are ligaments that connect the tibia and the fibula. Okay, and there's an anterior one right here and a posterior one right here. And along with the interosseous membrane that we're going to see on the next slide, these ligaments help to prevent excessive separation of the tibia from the fibula. Right here we see an anterior view of the right ankle joint and the lower leg. Medially we have the tibia right here and laterally we have the fibula. Down here we have the anterior tibiofibular ligament. We can't see the posterior part, but again, both of them would connect the distal ends of both of these bones. And then we have this much longer ligamentous structure made out of dense connective tissue, and this is the interosseous membrane that spans between the tibia and the fibula and also helps to prevent separation of these two bones. Sometimes you'll also hear it referred to as a syndesmosis, which is just a specific type of joint that is immovable and again prevents separation of these two bones. And just reiterating it here, a high ankle sprain normally causes damage to one of those three structures, the anterior or posterior tibiofibular ligaments or the interosseous membrane between the tibia and the fibula. Now the most common mechanism of injury for a high ankle sprain is excessive external rotation at the ankle. So basically when the foot externally rotates relative to the tibia and the fibula. Now, more often than not, this injury occurs in the closed chain, so where the foot is planted, and so it would actually be internal rotation of the ankle mortis relative to the talus. It very rarely would occur in open chain. Almost always it's in contact sports with a closed chain mechanism. And the typical presentation of somebody with a high ankle sprain is going to involve inability to bear weight on the affected lower extremity, or at the very least, pain with bearing weight. So they can bear weight, but it's painful. If they have total inability to bear weight on it, you're probably going to suspect a fracture, and normally the fracture is going to be of the fibula, often an avulsion fracture from the rupture of any of these ligaments. And you would confirm that with an x-ray. If the patient has the ability to at least partially weight bear, so they can still weight bear, but it's painful, it probably means there's no fracture. There's just ligamentous damage in any of the three aforementioned structures. And what that person's probably going to notice is that with everyday activities, there's going to be increased pain with any activity requiring ankle dorsiflexion. And the reason for that has to do with the structure of the talus. The talus is wider anteriorly than it is posteriorly. And if we look at the arthrokinematics of dorsiflexion, when you dorsiflex the ankle, the talus rolls anteriorly, and if it rolls anteriorly, and it's wider anteriorly, then the ankle mortis better also widen to accommodate the increased width of the talus anteriorly. And the only way for the ankle mortis to widen is for the tibia to slightly separate from the fibula. So the tibia will move slightly medially, and the distal fibula will move slightly laterally, and that puts stretch 
on these ligaments, which are potentially already damaged, and that causes pain. Additionally, high ankle sprains normally cause pain anteriorly, and it's usually more lateral than it is medial. So if we want to be very general here, we can say with high ankle sprains, in most cases, the pain is going to be higher up, and it's going to be anterolateral. The first special test for a high ankle sprain is the external rotation test. This is typically done with the patient in sitting with their legs dangling off the edge of the table. The PT is then going to stretch the affected ankle, in this case the right one, into maximum dorsiflexion and then apply an external rotation force. So there's the dorsiflexion and then I'm going to apply an external rotation force. There you see it right there. Now the rationale of this test is that dorsiflexion widens the ankle mortis, which adds stress to the syndesmosis, that interosseous membrane, which may potentially be injured. And the external rotation further stretches it. So a positive test here is going to be familiar pain provocation over the anterolateral ankle. Unfortunately, as a standalone test, it's not very good to rule out or rule in. The sensitivity is only 71%, so if the test is negative, there's only a 71% chance that they don't have a high ankle sprain. And the specificity is also fairly poor, only 63%. Again, if this test were positive, there's only a 63% chance that they have a high ankle sprain. So normally, the results of this test are combined with this one, which has a much better specificity, very poor sensitivity, but very good specificity at 94%. This is the syndesmotic squeeze test. To perform this test, the patient can either be seated, as they were in the external rotation test before, or they can be hook lying, as you see right here, with respect to the affected lower extremity, in this case, the right one. To perform this test, the PT is gonna begin by compressing the proximal fibula and the tibia together. This squeezes the syndesmosis between the tibia and the fibula. And then the PT is going to apply a series of these same forces compressing these two bones from proximal to distal, so working their way down the lower leg until they get to the level of the lateral malleolus, and then you just don't go below that. So it's a series of squeezes going down the leg. And a positive test is going to be familiar pain provocation. It's generally going to be felt in the anterolateral ankle region. But if that pain is felt more proximally, so maybe the pain is felt when I squeeze up top, that tends to mean that the injury is more severe. If they only feel pain when the squeeze is applied just above the lateral malleolus, so more distally, that sometimes implies that the injury is less severe. So in other words, the higher up the squeeze where they feel the pain, the more severe the injury tends to be. Okay? As we talked about before briefly, the sensitivity of this test is actually pretty poor. Uh, you shouldn't use it to rule out a high ankle sprain, but the specificity is excellent, 94%. So again, if they test positive for the syndesmotic squeeze test, there's a 94% chance that they do have a high ankle sprain. And you might even be a tad more sure of your diagnosis if they also have a positive external rotation test. Now the treatment of a high ankle sprain depends on whether it's a minor or major sprain. If it's a minor sprain, that implies that there's insignificant widening of the ankle mortis. Remember, if there's a lot of ligamentous damage there, you would expect the tibia to separate excessively from the fibula. But if there's insignificant widening of the ankle mortis, then that implies the sprain is most likely minor. And so you can get away with conservative care. So initially, they'd probably follow the RICE protocol in the acute stage, rest, ice, compression, and elevation, eventually progressing to ambulating in a walking boot, and eventually gentle strengthening of all the muscles of the ankle joint, but especially of the fibularis muscles, fibularis longus and brevis. If it was a major sprain, that would imply significant widening of the ankle mortis, so significant separation of the tibia and the fibula, and oftentimes with that, surgery is done to correct. In any case, if the person's going to return to sport, there's a number of things that have to happen before they're cleared to do so. One of them is passing the hopping test. This is a validated test that is basically just having the person hop 
15 times on their affected lower extremity. So if somebody had a left high ankle sprain, then they would do the hopping test on the left leg. No right leg involvement at all. If they can't hop 15 times, well, then they don't pass the hopping test and they don't return to sport. The other thing that they'd have to have is no obvious widening between the tibia and the fibula on x-rays. Again, if it was a minor sprain, you'd be less concerned about that. But if it was a major sprain and they had to have surgery, uh, then you'd want to also verify that before they're cleared to do the hopping test and also before they're returning to their sport. Thank you for all your support. Be sure to check out my Instagram for cool science and not science stuff.